Okay, Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. In this message, I'll be between verses 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. But in this case, I'm going to spend time in verse 4 first and then work my way back up. Uh, verse 4, 3, 2, 1. I think that's probably the, 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 the better way to address this. Uh, the, the main reason why is because the way that this is presented is that the, the writer goes kind of from the general and then uh, and then presents some specifics. And sometimes it can be a lot easier to just go right to the specifics first and then generalize from there. And this is one of those examples where I think it would be it would be better to address these passages in that way. Now, the letter that was written to the Hebrews here, I, I personally think it was written by the Apostle Paul. And the way that Hebrews chapter 13 is written gives me a lot of evidence to encourage me to believe that. Uh, we don't really need to know who wrote it, of course. The, the content is fantastic. But, uh, but it's my opinion that, that it was the Apostle Paul who wrote it. The fact that we do not have his name on the letter, to me, is evidence that he wrote it because uh, this was sent to the Jews and being sent to the Jews. If the Jews would have, would have seen his name on it, it would have been rejected uh, just because of his popularity and because of all the, the issues related to the Apostle Paul, especially there in the nation of Israel at that time. Uh, but the way that chapter 13 is written, uh, the, the structure of it and the things that he presents or that are presented is, is similar to the way that, that Paul wrote some of his other letters to the Ephesians and, and, and to the Colossians. The way that he wrote other letters, there's a similarity here that leads me to believe that. Also, if you keep reading towards the end of chapter 13, at the end in verse 23, it says, Know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Uh, to mention Timothy in this case and the idea of being imprisoned, uh, this, this tells me that it, it probably was certainly the, the Apostle Paul who wrote this. Uh, out of the people who, who, who Paul interacted with, it's unlikely that, that there would have been someone who would have had as much maturity uh, as, was, as is displayed, as is expressed here in this letter besides the Apostle Paul. Also, Paul had very few people. He didn't have a lot of people that he connected with. Uh, and to, and to, to put somebody's name in here, all right, to put the name of a person, uh, this again, and, and, to, and to write it in a way that you expect that, that, the, that the person who receives this letter is going to know who Timothy is, uh, that, that also reduces the number of people uh, who, who, could, who could possibly have written this letter. All right. And so, you know, I personally believe that that's the case. And, and, and what he does in other letters, in, uh, in other letters that he wrote, is similar to what we have here. What we have is we have a list. That's what we've got. We've got a list of things that he says, don't do these things. All right. That, that shows up in a lot of places. And people ask me about it all the time. You know, why is it that there's this list? Because this list gives the impression that these are laws that we are to obey. You know, that we live by the law. And here's, here, here's a list of some laws that we should be sure that we are in obedience to. All right. What I always mention to people when it comes to this is, is try to remember, try to, you know, try to understand that Paul already wrote a lot of stuff. Okay, He already had a lot to say in the previous chapters. Right? Here we are in this letter. We're in chapter 13. We got 12 chapters of Paul explaining, right, or whoever the writer was, explaining that we are free from the law. And then at the end, he's going to impose or, you know, or, or, or mention that we are to live in obedience to the law. 
That's that's not the case. All right, it just that is not that that is not the way that this is written. But but people will gravitate to that. They make that assumption. Oh boy, here we go. You know, here's our chance, kind of thing. And it doesn't mean that at all. What it means is that on the basis of everything that is said that has been said prior, now consider this on the basis of everything that has been said prior. All right. Now, one of the themes that I have presented through this entire book here, the book of Hebrews, is that we are going to experience change and growth and maturity as a believer. All right. And, and, and so as we experience these, these changes and this growth, uh, one of the ways that this may be expressed is that, is that there, there will be a time when we will be tempted to engage in sin. But because there has been a change in who we are, we may decide that we are not going to engage in that sin. All right? We might be tempted not to sin. That could very well take place. In fact, I would expect that in many, in, in many areas of our lives, this is the kind of thing that, that, that should be real. And so as these as these changes happen, as these things take place within us, we are going to be encouraged by the Holy Spirit to say no to sin. We, we may on occasion be encouraged by the Holy Spirit of God to do something, you know, to either not do something or to do something. And when these things happen, I mean, when, when we are encouraged by the Holy Spirit of God to move in one direction or another, uh, then then just let that be, okay? Let that be, and and follow through with that. Do not resist the work of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. If He does this work in you, then let it be so. If you decide that you are going to say no to sin, then do so. It's something that you are to let be out of the fullness of what you have in Christ or out of who you are now in Christ Jesus. And so you start with the fact that we are free from the law so that we can enter into a new covenant. We then have a relationship with our God that will, that, that will result in changes and transformations that happen within us as a person. And so after all of that, when the circumstances present themselves, look, just just don't engage in sin and there might be some good things you can do all right that's that's all that these lists are about they're nothing more than statements to say in these kinds of circumstances if the holy spirit so directs you do not resist the work of god in your life just don't resist and follow through with what he directs you to do another thing to keep in mind is that there were a lot of people who were misusing what Paul was teaching. Peter mentions this in one of his, in one of his letters, that, that people were using what Paul was teaching in order to engage in sin, to justify sin. They, they, they would say, well, since you know the sin issue is over, since we're totally forgiven and he, God doesn't hold our sins against us anymore, then we might as well just go ahead and Go in and, and indulge our flesh. If God is not going to punish us for that, just go in and, 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 and live like the devil. And of course, that was not the purpose that God set us free. He did not set us free so that we could go and indulge the flesh. He set us free so that we could walk in the newness of life. Now, it is true that people will misuse the grace of God and use it as justification to indulge their flesh. And they probably would indulge their flesh anyway, even if they didn't have justification, right? So it's not, it's not like people are being given a license to sin or of some kind. It's not about that at all. But there, there, there will always be people like that. I even hear from people on occasion who tell me, yeah, sure enough, I, I did that too. I heard what you were teaching. And I thought, hey, you know, let's just go ahead and indulge. You know, they, they decided to go out and indulge their flesh for a long while and then realized that that just isn't, wasn't working out for them. And so they came back and they, they realized that, well, yeah, what I was saying about 
walking in the newness of life is true and that they decided that they that they would engage their life in that way and move in that direction. All right, now not, not everybody will, will do that, but the, the point is, is that yes, there are, there are people who will always misuse the truth of God for their own personal self-interest in that respect out of the context or outside of the boundaries of what God intended, all right? That is going to happen. However, having said that, there will be some people who will not misuse the truth of God for the purpose of trying to justify the indulgence of their flesh. There are people who will decide to follow through and walk in the newness of life. And it turns out that it is better for those few people to do that than for nobody to do that. And that's what often happens. When, when pastors or preachers or teachers or whoever, when they decide that they are not going to tell people about the grace of God, that's a decision that a lot of people make. Some people will, will not teach the truth because they genuinely don't believe it. But there are others who do believe the truth, but they won't teach it because they are concerned that others will misuse what they are teaching, abuse the freedom that they have in Christ, and they don't and, 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 and the teacher does not want to be known as someone who contributes to the sin of somebody else. All right? And so they will intentionally not teach the grace of God. I know people like this. I can give you names and phone numbers, you know, of people who 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 are like that. But it's my but when they do that. Nobody knows the grace of God. Nobody knows the inheritance in Christ. Nobody walks in the newness of life. And so it's my, it's my position that it is better for some people to walk in the newness of life than for none. Okay? It is better for some than for none, even if it means that most may use the truth inappropriately. My view on that is that, well, they're going to do those things anyway. And so, so they do. So they do these things in, 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 in a sense of justification because they're free from the law. Well, whatever, whatever, whatever justification they decide to use, they're still going to engage in evil. And so, I really don't think anything is lost. I don't see that, but there are others who do, and and so that's that's a struggle that that exists, and I, I believe it will always exist. I, I genuinely believe that it's always going to be an issue. All right, so going back to Hebrews chapter 13, uh, starting out in verse 1, it says, let brotherly love continue. And, and that's the theme, all right? So in light of everything, let brotherly love continue. The idea behind that, the, 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 the paradigm thought behind that is, that is that you're going to be encouraged to love others. All right, it's going to happen. So don't resist that when it happens. And then he gives some examples. In verse 2, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Okay, and that's where I like to start. I like to start there at verse 4 and then work my way back up to verse 3, 2 and talk a little bit more about verse 1. In, in verse 4, he mentions marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled in the sense that if you have a well-defined relationship, if you have a marriage, a well-defined relationship, then, then you are free to, to, to have uh, lots of, 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 of personal interaction with the person with whom you are married to, and that should be encouraged and, 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 and do that, and it, there is no defilement that is taking place. But he says, but you know, uh, fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And this is an example. It's a way of saying, now look, you know, it says, don't violate the law of God. This is sin. 
so don't do this. Does that mean we now live by the law? And my answer is no. It, it is to be understood in light of chapters 1 through 12, where the writer explains that there is going to that you are free from the law so that you can walk on the newness of life so that you can forgive others as you have been forgiven so that you can love others as you have been loved and you know engaging in fornication and adultery those are not loving acts all right that is not an expression of love by definition and so you know in, in that sense as you are encouraged to not do these things don't resist that and don't do those things okay you know, now how a relationship can be defined um, really kind of depends on the perspective that you that you look at, that you look at it from. For example, uh, there, there are people who, who consider marriage to be defined by the state, whatever whatever government that they are subjected under at, at, at any given time, that the government defines what marriage is. And, and if, if that's how you want to look at it, it's, it's a place to start. The Mosaic Law does give a number of does we do have a number of laws in the Mosaic Law that when we assemble them together we can have a pretty good idea with regards to what the definition of marriage is between people as God has defined those things. When you look at the New Testament, there are some additional things that are mentioned there in the context of marriage that are not mentioned in the Mosaic Law. There can be a definition that can be described there. And so what, you know, what people are often struggling with is, is exactly, you know, is, is the question of exactly what marriage is sometimes. But regardless of how people work through that, there is always going to be a reasonably clear definition of what the relationship is between each person and what that means in terms of the covenant that they have between one another. And it's the same thing as how God has related to us. When God invoked the new covenant, he, prov he, he provided for us a clear definition of a, of, of a relationship between he and us. We, have a, we had a well understood, defined relationship of, in the new covenant. And we are to love others as he has loved us and make sure that when we engage in relationships with other people that we do have a well-defined relationship with the other person. And the idea of fornication and adultery is, is in general outside of those boundaries. Right? It's kind of interesting that he, that he mentions here that God will judge. You know, marriage is, an, is, is honorable. This is verse 4 is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Well, you could say a number of things. The, 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 the first thing that I can think of that I think is worth mentioning is that he has already judged. He has already determined that these things are wrong. These things are evil. And if anyone goes before God and says something to God that sounds like you should give me a place with you because I'm a good person, right? If anybody has ever engaged in these things or if they've even thought about doing these things, you know, if, 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 if one person saw another person and they had and they entertained the thought of engaging with this other person in these inappropriate ways, then God could build a case and he could say, you know, that's just as bad as doing it because you thought about it, you wanted to, you desired, you know, that, that kind of thing. As Jesus expressed in the Sermon on the Mount with, with, with regards to how sin could be, could be recognized. So, so God could easily, could easily then pass judgment on the person and say, well, look, you know, if that's how you want to be evaluated, then I will judge this. And I do believe that most of the people who go before God will have this kind of a conversation with him. Most people are going to go to go before the Lord when they physically die. And they're going to say something that sounds like, I was a pretty good person. You should let me in and give me a place there with you. And he's going to say, OK, if that's how you would like to be evaluated, according to whether you were a pretty good person or not, well, 
here we go. I will judge this. I will judge this. I will judge this and that and, and that and this until, you know, until you recognize that, no, that is that kind of criteria is not going to get you in. All right. That's not going to happen. So these kinds of things God will judge. Well, he's already judged them in the sense that we know that they are evil. He can continue to judge them as people want to have that kind of a conversation with him. You know, what's, what's interesting, especially with regards to adultery, too, is that in the law, the wages of adultery are death. You know, that's something that he told the people to judge. He didn't leave that for himself. He left that for the people. He said, look, you people, if you find that somebody, you know, that, that people engage in this way, if, if you see a, an adultery take place and you've got to have two or more witnesses as well, if, you, if, if this happens, then, then, then you are to hold a trial and you are to issue a judgment and you are to throw rocks at them until they are dead. All right? So if you want to teach the law, if you think that this is, uh, this is an admonition to return to the law, right? that's the law. The law is death. Okay? Adultery was never a justification for divorce. Nobody would get divorced over adultery. All right? That was not considered to be a legitimate reason for divorce. You know, I know in, in our current modern age, uh, a lot of people will think of that as a legitimate reason to be divorced. In fact, in, in, many, in many courts, in many, many states, if, if you, if you want to have a divorce and you bring the subject of adultery up, they, they have no concern for that at all. They have no interest in that at all. Nobody cares, you know, and, and that's unfortunate. But, uh, but in the Mosaic law, all right, it's death. That's what it is. Okay, nobody was divorced over adultery. People were executed. It was an execution. That, that, that's what it was. Uh, and so, you know, that's another way of understanding that this is not written for the purpose of telling the person to return to the law. Because if it was, well, then that's, that's what you do. And that's not really what he says. He says, God will judge these things. Be aware of these things. Acknowledge these things. As the Holy Spirit works in you, guides you and leads you love your neighbor as yourself let the love that god has given you continue and be presented to others and 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 so should you have personal relationships with others make sure they are well defined all right that's verse four going up to verse three remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. It's, you notice the way that this is said. It's not said as the prisoners are in the body also. It's written as you are in the body also. They're in the body. And you have joined in the body of Christ of which they are a part. Remember them. You know, and, 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 and perhaps be of assistance to them. Maybe, you know, maybe help them out if you can in some ways. Now, there is nothing in the Mosaic Law that requires you to do this. If you, if you don't do this, then, uh, then, then it doesn't mean that you have necessarily engaged in sin. In fact, there, there really is no place in the Mosaic Law for being imprisoned. The closest to it is if you kill someone... Uh, 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 without intending to do so, and then you would flee to a Levitical city, and you would have to remain within the Levitical city. But all other sins were resolved. You know, well, the, there was the opportunity to be enslaved, uh, and and so you could you could consider that to be a form of imprisonment. But uh, but in general, that was just not part of Israelite society. Uh, but of course, by the time this letter was written, things had changed quite a bit, and we have prisoners in this kind of a circumstance. And if a person is encouraged to be of assistance to a prisoner, then they should do so. And if you are not encouraged to be of assistance to a prisoner, then you should not feel guilty or ashamed or, or anything like that if you decide not to do that. All right. Otherwise, you're now back under 
a system of law, which is going to have all the consequences related, related to living by, living by the law, by your new set of laws that you are now defining uh, with regards to taking care of prisoners. You know, there, there, are, there are some good opportunities uh, with, with helping people who are in prison. Um, not, not as much as sometimes is promoted, but there are some good opportunities. Whenever there is a significant life change in a person's life, whenever a person has, ex has an experience, has a significant change in their life, some, something dramatic happens and they now have to redefine what their life is going to be, there's always an opportunity for them to consider to include God in the new definition of what their life is going to look like. Right. And, and, and there can be many different circumstances in life when a person is now going to have to redefine what their life is going to be like. Going into a prison as a prisoner is one of those times, one of many, one of those circumstances when life has changed in a big way. It is time to redefine what your life is going to look like. And it's common, it's, it's common, just, just about every prisoner who goes into prison will take some time to think about the things of God. And it's, and it's normally within the, the first three weeks, just in general. It, it, it's normally within the first three weeks that a person will think about the things of God as they are, they are discovering the new institution that they are a part of. And then after that, they, they, they will, they will get an idea about what what they can do and what their life can look like usually about three weeks because because these institutions are, are well defined confinement has limited things that you can do and so it doesn't take very long <clears throat> before a person can can identify what their op what their options are and then they pick and choose and decide, okay, this is what my life is now going to look like. This is what my life is now going to be like. And so if, if, if a person doesn't, doesn't really get committed within the first three weeks or so, then, it, then, then it's unlikely that they will later on. It doesn't mean they won't. It just means that it's, it's, the probability is much lower. And when they do, what will happen? Well, in, in general, they will embrace... The, the, the whatever the mainstream popular Christianity is in the world, which for the most part is repent and obey. You know, that's, that's, that's the, the general message that is presented by the Christian world. Uh, God expects this of you. You do this, you will be blessed. If you don't, you'll be cursed. And make sure you're in church whenever the doors are open and pay your tithes. You know, that's, that's what church is for most people. And so when, when, when this happens within, within the prison system, it's no different than outside of the prison system, in which case there will be few people, few people who will discover and embrace the new covenant and the grace of God. Through my radio program, I, I hear from people all the time who are in prisons, and, uh, and, and, and in most cases, they're just asking for written materials, of which I... I don't have any written materials at this time, and, and so I, I don't have anything I can send them. But, uh, but on occasion, I do hear from people, and of those who I hear from, only a few, very few, really grasp the message of the gospel and the new covenant. Very, very few of, of those that I even hear from. So that's kind of a general overview about what it's like for prisoners and that in general, they, they just need written materials, uh, you know, maybe a few nice things that, 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 uh, that they're allowed to have. And you just have to talk with them and find out what, uh, what, what you can send them or what you can have sent to them in order to make their lives a little bit better. But the main objective really is to encourage them to grow more in their understanding of the gospel and the grace of God so that they can experience change and transformation during their time while they are there that will continue once they are released and, and they reintegrate within society. They experience another significant life change when they are released and they return to, to, uh, to general society. All right, But there's an opportunity for people to feel quite guilty if they don't participate 
in these things, if they don't assist prisoners. And that, that of course, demonstrates that they are being uh, pressured by a system of law instead of it being an expression of what God has done in their lives. And, and, if they, and if God has not done that kind of a work in their life, then he will do that in somebody else's life. There will always be someone who the prisoners will be able to interact with and have access to. The, the Lord is not, going, is not going to be in a situation where he cannot reach out to people who want to know who he is. That's not going to happen. Uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, this can also be a big opportunity for religious pride from the prisoner's point of view, because they can also look at this and they can and they can pass judgment against people who are not prisoners and say, you know, those Christians out there, they are not loving me like they ought to. They are not remembering me like they ought to. They don't recognize that they are a body of Christ like I am. You know, that they are, they, are, they are a part of the body of Christ like I am and that I am a person in need and they have an abundance and they're not sharing. You know, there, is a, there's a, a, there, there are a lot of opportunities for pride and for condemnation uh, that, and for bitterness that can be stirred up within a person because of verse 3, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3, because the prisoners would look at this and pass judgment on other Christians who are not fulfilling this to the satisfaction of the prisoner, all right? And that is an inappropriate use of verse 3. Going back up to verse 2, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. Okay, now in entertaining strangers and helping someone out who is a stranger, there is an opportunity for you to discover someone new, for you to perhaps have a, a new relationship with somebody. You know, this is an expression of love to reach out to someone who you do not know very well so that there can be there, 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 there can be the beginning of a relationship between you and them. This is something that happens as, you know, in the way that God relates to us. It's not much different. The way that God relates to us and we relate to him is that he reaches out to us as if we are strangers. And when we begin to consider him as a person, he himself in many ways is like a stranger to us. You know, and so every relationship must have a beginning. And as the Lord encourages you to interact with more people, to discover more people, to build relationships with more people. You know, sometimes people will ask me, well, you know, where do I go to church? I just want to go to church. I want to be around other Christian people. And, 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 you know, in some circumstances, if, you, if, you're not, if you're not going to be able to find a healthy, you know, a reasonably healthy and well, uh, well-rounded group of people who have a reasonable understanding of the grace of God, then go find some strangers and interact with them and build some relationships with them, you know, and, 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 and be of assistance to them, especially when they're in a situation of need. If you're encouraged to do so, then do so. Do not, re, do not resist the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart, in your person, when it comes to a circumstance like that. Or if the Lord, the Lord is not encouraging you to do so, and you see an opportunity, and you decide to do so, then by all means do so. You know, I'm sure that God will go with you. He may not have sent you, but you can bring him right on in there. And he will certainly find ways of participating, I'm sure. All right, that's verse 2. He also speaks of angels. And, and, and that, you know, you don't want to entertain strangers because, because you might miss out on an opportunity to meet an angel. And that, that would be the only reason. That's why I wanted to talk about that for a few minutes before. But the, but, but, but the issue related to angels is another issue. And it is another opportunity. And this is one of the ways that this, that this kind of interaction often happens because angels are not likely going to take up residency next door to where you live. And then, you know, one day you're, you're going to meet them. They're not necessarily, you shouldn't expect an angel to, to show up at your workplace and work there for a couple of years before you decide to talk with them about the things of the Lord. All right. 
<clears throat> that's not what angels are going to do. They're not going to come and, and take a job and they're not going to come and move in and live in the house next to you or in the apartment nearby. You know, that's, that, that's not how angels are going to interact. They are going to be recognized as strangers in, in, in that sense. And they're not going to stick around. All right. And, and, he, and you don't want to do this just just because, you know, there, there may you may have an opportunity to see an angel or interact with an angel and you don't want to miss out on that. You should be doing that as an expression of love towards others anyway. And that there may be an opportunity where the Lord can make use of that such that you can minister to an angel and he can minister to you in return and that you can have a moment of interaction with them, not, not necessarily knowing the magnitude of the circumstances at hand, and that you can be a part of the work of God in that respect. And so if you are encouraged to do that, then, then by all means, you should do that and not resist, as you probably would have previously. There are lots of people who have presented testimonies concerning uh, experiences that they have had with other with, with angels and uh, and some of them may may not be true uh, I, I would think that that many of them are certainly true I don't think it's important to to try to pass judgment and determine whether or not they were something that really happened I don't think that's really of importance but I can say of myself that I personally have had an interaction with an angel and I didn't know for many years. I, I kind of had a suspicion, but for many years I didn't know until I did enough of an investigation that I was able to find enough evidence that turned out that it convinced me that that was an angelic encounter. And I don't like to speak about it because I don't want people to, to, to think of me or to recognize me for, uh, for being a person who interacted with an angel for for 10 minutes you know and somehow that that gives me some special position with god you know that i have this special connection this special relationship with god that you don't have and so i am greater than you some people will take that kind of a position and i do not want to be looked at by you in that way at all i really don't or that because i met an angel maybe that has that that gives me an increase in credibility concerning what i might have to say or what i might have to to share about who god is and i just don't think that that's a legitimate that's an, a, a legitimate way to relate to other people you know when it comes to sin just as something good like that may happen if something bad happens a lot of people they're known for the worst sin that they've ever committed. You know, you think about a person and you think, okay, well, who is that person? That's the person who did that. You know, they did that thing. And so I generally don't give a testimony concerning the magnitude of my sins, especially those that, uh, that I had before I came to know the Lord. So also, I don't speak too much about the great things that happen as well, because that could skew the issue in the other direction, in which case the attention that people have gets placed more on me than on the Lord, which is where it needs to belong. I'm simply a witness of the Lord, someone who testifies of the Lord. I'm not looking for opportunities to boast about myself and that people may may think of me in those in, in those ways. All right, so then going back up to verse 1, let brotherly love continue. And that's it. Okay, in light of all that he said, let brotherly love continue. And these are some examples of circumstances where these may these things may happen. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels you know entertain strangers that's a loving thing to love others with the love that, that god has shared with you if you are encouraged to do so by all means do so remember the prisoners as if chained with them those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also should an opportunity present itself take the opportunity you know and relate to them and talk with them you know, I get a lot of opportunities. I do not take those, take all the opportunities that uh, just because a prisoner writes me that I'm going to write them back. I don't, I don't function that way. I don't do that. And so I'm not going to say that someone is evil if they don't do that either. I do turn to the Holy Spirit 
to the Spirit of God to guide me and direct me concerning what I am going to do. If, the, if I was to respond to every form of correspondence that I received, that's all that I would do. You know, that's, I mean, that's, I receive so much that, that, that I simply could not do, I could not do other things uh, besides that. And, and, I, and the Lord has given me other things to work on. So I have to be true to those things. In, uh, in verse 4, marriage is honorable, uh, honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Another thing to keep in mind concerning this is that when he speaks in verse 4 about fornication and adultery, he speaks about this in the context of identity. All right, that this is simply not who you are anymore. Now, you may very well be a child of God who engages in sin, but that doesn't change who you are. You are still a child of God. And so, and, and so should you have a place in the kingdom of heaven or not, when you speak with the Lord about having a place in the kingdom of heaven, if he sees you and he recognizes you as a child of God, he is not going to recognize you, recognize you as an adulterer or as a fornicator or as a murderer or as someone who has violated the Sabbath law. You know, there are lots of sins for which you would be you would be stoned to death over. You know, there are lots of sins uh, that that's not how he's going to relate to people. He's going to relate to them in the context of are they spiritually alive or spiritually dead? If a person is not born again by the Spirit of God, then their identity can very well be these things. But if you are born again by the Spirit of God, you are simply a child of God who is engaging in sin. And it needs to be understood as what it is, which, which is sin. No question about that. But in that context, to see it in this way, uh, it's, an, it's an admonition. Look, don't, don't, don't do these things that are inconsistent with who you are. Don't do these things that are clearly inconsistent with who you are. Just don't be a part of these things. God will judge these people, but that is not who you are, and so do not do these things. That's another way to, to understand verse 4. But then he goes to covetousness. All right, And if you can recall what I was presenting at the end of chapter 12, Right, the end of chapter twelve. There have been, been, been many, there were many circumstances where I mentioned, especially when it came to the two mountains, that when it came to the tenth commandment, all right, when it came to a do not covet, that's when people said, "No, Lord, we don't want to hear from you." All right, but here in chapter thirteen, he brings up covetousness in verse five. All right. So it's something that can be brought up and something that I want you to notice and think about. I'm going to speak about this in the next message is the fact that under the old covenant, right, there, there, there is nothing that's going that is present there that will help a person overcome or work through coveting their neighbor's stuff. All right. There's nothing in the law that will assist with regards to that. But through the transformation that happens with a person who has been born again by the Spirit of God, there can be some occasions when a person can be encouraged to say no to the temptation to covet. And so he can bring it up in chapter 13, verse 5, in this context, not as a law, but as an understanding. Look, this is something that can be real to you that could have never been real to anybody else before. In fact, this was what caused the original separation between the entire nation of Israel and God. All right? But now, through the new covenant, through the new defined relationship, through being made into a new creation, you know, there can be some opportunities when a person doesn't need to go covet something or somebody. That, you know, where coveting is not doesn't necessarily have to be a part of their life all the time, all right, or, or as much as it would be otherwise. They could say no to the temptations of coveting. Very well placed here at the end of the, the, the letter that was written here to the Hebrews. 
All right, so for those of you who are in some small groups, I've got a question for you here. How do you know when you love by law or love by grace? It's, it's just an open-ended question. How do you know when you are loving by law or loving by grace? How would you answer that kind of a question? How could you maybe relate to that kind of a question? I think it's a good question to ask when it comes to this kind of a topic, all right? And I will continue into verse 5 in the next message. Thanks.